I realized that, you know, I had brought a, a lot of my equipment into Valve and all my pinball machines. It took a 26-foot truck to get all my crap out. It's like the place looked like a ghost town when we packed up and left. Oh. It's like, it felt weird. It's like there was like this entire hallway that was all pinball machines and that was completely empty. It just felt weird walking down there and uh, uh, like our whole office was just a complete wreck because we weren't very careful like taking stuff down and I heard from one of my compadres there that for for months they walked by and they didn't even want to look in that office. <laughs> it's oh. like it was a person. <laughs> Again, I, I I loved Valve. I loved them, and I I uh, I was drinking the Kool Aid, believing that I really had an impact around there. But you know, this weird paranoia in the company that their culture was going to be contaminated. They went on a witch hunt and got rid of me and a bunch of other um, talented folks um, and just a couple people too so it's not it's, it's just a couple people hmm. and I mean that's when you have no management a couple people can go through and wreak havoc like that wow I've probably gone way far down well, no. <laughs> farther than I should have I mean they they definitely don't want these kinds of stories out there so well, I think every company has their positives and negatives, and there's been plenty of positive about Valve. I mean, people know that, but obviously, everything's not perfect everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you certainly have experience starting your own businesses, many, many yeah. of them, and landing on your feet. So, how did you end up collaborating with your partner? How did you meet Rick Johnson? I know you said he was part of your group, but how did you decide, we're going to do this project together? So, uh... Um just to emphasize how hard we were working, so Rick was working on another project, you know, a full day's work, and then he believed in this so much that he would come hang out with me in the evenings, and we'd work until, you know, wee hours the morning on this AR stuff. And so that's how he got started, just kind of part-time working like eight or nine hours on a regular, his regular job part of it, of Valve, and then he'd work for six hours for me. And then as these game experiences started coming together and we're like, this really is the future. Um, he came over and worked full time with me, and that only hap only you know it was only a month until you know unfortunately he got canned with us too. Um, probably if he would have stayed away, then he would have been fine. But um, I, I don't know. I'm speculating. Um, but we really believed in it, and we um, that's why we were going to do this lunch thing. And by July, that was our goal. By July, we were going to show it. So after we got laid off, um, we started negotiating with their lawyers, which it was a lot of work to actually actually make um, getting our stuff under agreeable terms happen. You know, Gabe says, just give it to him. That's not the reality <laughs> of how business works. Right. But um, we managed to get the stuff that we wanted free and clear. And uh, we started working. Right, we got laid off. Rick and I... Um, decided let, let's just plan how we're gonna do this like we're gonna get the stuff so we went and we watched Dukes of Hazard and drank an entire bottle of wine and <laughs> talked about how we're gonna do it and after I woke up sometime around like two in the morning the next day <laughs> I, or two in the afternoon the next day um, I uh, just started packing up all my personal tools and went over to Rick's house which Rick has this big family room so I Start loading up the laser cutter and the little mini li mill and <laughs> laser cutter hangover. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> and we just uh, we started working the next day just as if it um, had nothing had happened. And so that's what we've been doing. So for the last probably four months, we uh, took all the tech, we got it out um, within a couple weeks, and with some like good faith um, agreement. And uh, I had developed a lot of this technology that hadn't actually been proved out yet. And um, what's amazing is in like three weeks or four weeks after we left Valve, like almost everything that we were working on and working towards came together like ahead of schedule. When we were able to um, make this very inexpensive tracking system. So when you're doing, maybe I should describe it. Yes, first. describe what right. the project is. Yeah, this is... This is what you would see wearing our glasses. It's glasses. Um, we anticipate them to weigh between 60 and 90 grams, which is very lightweight. Um, you put them on, you roll out a special mat onto your table, 
and we can project 3D characters or graphics that's at the surface level, above the surface level, or into the surface. Okay, okay. so that's kind of the, the limitations of what you can see. You can see stuff, you can even see stuff that flies up towards your face too. Um, so also with that we developed a tracking system that tracks your head position with submillimeter accuracy. So up to three meters away or actually greater than that, but we can get sub-millimeter accuracy. We can figure out the rotation of your head, how close you are to the table, um, mm. if you're which side of the table you're on. That allows us to uh, render graphics on the table. So you can imagine Star Wars chess as an example. There's little chess characters just walking around your table, and if I'm sitting in front looking at facing forward at them, I see their faces of the opponent's team, but I can stand up and walk around the table and then I can see the back side of the characters. Uh -huh, okay. Or if if I'm rendering a big castle on the table, I can peer down inside the castle, I can look over the top of the walls of the castle and look down inside. So that's the kind of graphics that we can do. On top of just putting graphics out into the world, we can also put it around things. So we had we developed a figurine tracker so we can track figurines and props and various things out in the world. So like your so you put your game. minis down. Okay. Exactly. So we can track those with the same precision as we can track your head position. So you take your miniature and you put it down and we can know exactly where that is. So we can have gameplay where you actually move physical props. So for instance, Dungeons and Dragons. And I, I should let Rick come on sometime and explain. <laughs> no, he plays. Play. For... <laughs> he's he's like a Rick is a um He's shipped games since like the mid '90s or early '90s. He's shipped 20 or 30 games. He's a game designer, oh. so he'll be able to explain game better than me. <laughs> uh, chances are, I'm going to say these things. You guys will be like, "I don't want to play that." But <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, already very interesting. Potential. Uh, yeah. So, you, for instance, a Dungeons and Dragons game. You could imagine you have props, which are walls and pathways, and you could put those down, and we track where those are. And now you can augment those with graphics. So you could have a trail and you could have monsters hiding in the bushes and the bushes would actually be rendered there and your characters, you'd pick them up and you'd move them down the trail and you'd be doing your different... Um, are they <laughs> solid? Going. Are they just like clear? Like you can see, are they solid bushes with color and everything like that? Or is it like a shape outline and you, and you can see inside? So the... Fig uh, like the I objects. Mean, Let's say you have a, a bush and you're talking about. Is it just like, okay, it's a blue outline of a bush, it's three-dimensional and you can see inside it, or is it like, hey, here's an actual, you know, very close to a real-looking bush with color and things like that? What do the graphics look like? So graphics is everything that you would imagine on a normal PC. So you can render a bush, and if you were to put your head close enough to the surface and the bush was big enough, you could put your head right inside the tree and you'd see the tree branches. And oh, wow. We have, a, we have a lot of examples like that where... Uh, things are sticking up and you can look in them or actually put your head to um, cross, you know, this goes through their clipping plane types. Again, I'm talking about stuff I don't know. I'm a technologist, but um, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's 24-bit color. It's 120 hertz. It's, um, there's some artifacts because you do have to compete a little bit with uh, ambient light. So if it's like sun shining in, you're not going to get as vivid as colors as if the, the lights are dimmer, but um, you know, it's what you would expect as, um, you know, projecting these images out there. Along with the figurine tracker, so you can imagine all the gameplay stuff that you can do with props, and you can move them as fast as you want. But we also made a wand, so a lot of the game interactions with the synthetic or graphics that you're rendering out in the world, you just kind of want to grab a stick and poke them. So we made a wand that can be tracked, and it has an analog stick on top of it and a trigger, and you can poke into things and some of our game experiences we don't have any full-fledged games up and going yet and that's what we're actually working on now but you can we have a, like a Jenga block type game I hmm. can't say the word Jenga I guess because it's uh, <laughs> I really called it Jerga because it's based off of I said asked him to make a Jenga type game one night but you can poke the wand into the blocks and then you can jerk up oh. really hard on the, the wand and they go flying all in the air and come crashing down and Actually, the way we have it rendered right now is the blocks are stacked above the surface, and then there's a little platform rendered, and then the um, platform just 
there's nothing. It's like a big hole in the table. So if you knock the blocks like in the air, they like crash down and then they fall forever. <laughs> and you can just like you can peer yeah. over the top of your um, over the top of your table, and it. It, it feels really cool because it looks like there's this hole that's going on forever and there's all these pieces tumbling down. Um, hmm. So it's interesting. The reason this is different than, say, your iPad, you know, we've all seen these kind of things on your iPad. It's once you put them on your, put the displays on your face, you no longer have to think about holding anything. Your hands are free to interact with this uh, real world and synthetic world things um, are tracking so good that you don't have to worry about um, losing tracking. We've all used those iPad things where mm. you don't get the, the thing into the camera. It doesn't show up. So, right. Or you wave at the Kinect for hours. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, I just looked at the new Kinect today. It looks pretty hot, actually. <laughs> nice. I haven't seen it yet. I uh, don't know if they're going to actually have any good gameplay, but <laughs> <laughs> it looks good uh, from so, a technology standpoint. How would you um, say this differs from like a Google Glass or Oculus Rift or other kind of pre- glasses that you've seen prototypes for? So our, our main thing on ours is the tracking system. So being able to track each player, you can have multiple players, as many players as you want standing around the table looking at the, the objects. And you can work with with objects and wands and stuff like that and know exactly where they are in the physical space. Uh, Google Glass doesn't do that. It's just an information display which is great for cell phone on your face type applications and getting driving directions. So they're knocking it um, out of the park there. And then Oculus Rift is total immersion. Um, you see nothing of the world around you. Um, you're completely removed and um, you see a full synthetic world. Um, uh, that's interesting. Uh, you can do these simulators. To, simulators so realistic that you get ill and, or dizzy. Yeah, I was hearing that you don't do that with this, because I, I do get motion sick, you know, and I've I heard something about yours being not quite as as harsh for those who have issues with spinning. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I had trouble with the Oculus. I think it's so cool. I mean, you're immersed, but um, you feel funny before, or I mean, during or after, or many people do at least. So the difference with this is since it's glasses, it doesn't block your peripheral vision, and you can... Um, look out the sides. You can look at your friends across the table. You don't feel like you're cut off from the world. Mm -hmm. And plus the big thing is since it's locked to the world, like when you rotate your head, um, the characters on the table stay put. There's no conflicting cues with your inner ear. So um, when you're totally cut off, like in VR, you can, it's, you're susceptible to getting sick because you don't know which way's up or you can be slightly canted to the side and graphics will be going by you in a funny way and your okay. your mind just like gets um, overwhelmed with that in your inner ear. Just like being sick on a boat or something. Uh, now something about our tech that makes it um, interesting is that we took a different approach. Instead of trying to put the light directly into your eyes, which is like 95% of the um, techniques out there, and that's a really hard problem. We put little tiny projectors on the top of the glasses and they project out to this special mat. And I mentioned that earlier, you roll this mat out. And this mat has a special property to it. It's called retroreflective. So each user projects its own stereoscopic image out there. And then it hits the surface and bounces directly back to the user. So other people in the room don't see what you're projecting. So that's how you can have as many users around the table as you want. Mm. It's because each person's receiving a unique image back and that has a lot of benefits the weight is huge the um, cost of doing that is is huge uh, huge difference uh, glass optics is expensive we're using all plastic op optics for these little pico projectors and um, you're focused at a real distance so it doesn't matter if you have wide set eyes or your eyes are really narrow um, where other head mount display systems, you have to get that dialed in perfectly or you're going to be looking wall-eyed or cross-eyed. You're looking at a real distance. That. Yeah, since you're looking at the, the table, your eyes are verging at the right distance and we have exact lock on that table so the images line up perfectly so that your eyes will cross at the right spot. So you can wear them for hours. We have people that just come beta test our stuff and they just... Actually, when we were at Valve, it was funny, like the people inside the... Um, the hardware lab would come by and like play our little sample games. We have like a zombie game that you lead a zombie around with the wand. 
and, or not a zombie, I mean you lead a, um, a, a player around and there's zombies that are attacking you. 